and I let him finish. And then I just walked past us. Evening, Dad. <laughs> walked up, gave him a bit of his own back. He was, he was almost embarrassed that he'd been caught being nice. You know, it's very funny. And it, people adored him. They were very fond of him. Because he was nice to everybody else outside the family. It's one of those Irish things, you know. Everybody else is uh, terrific, but your own you kind of uh, you can stick. In 1953, Barry did his national service. While some played war games, he played trumpet in the army band. And with the help of a correspondence course, he also learned to arrange jazz. When I came out of the army when I was about 22, I don't remember a part of my life prior to that where it hadn't been one of, of, of discipline of one sort or another. And so when I started my group and got out on my own, it was like, God, I flew like a bird. I found three musicians that I'd been in the army with and the three local musicians in New Yorkshire. So we formed the first seven. Let's go over to the bandstand where the John Barry Seven are all set to rock and roll their way through a number called You've Got Away. Take it, boys. Up, Tom. You've got away that I need so much. You've got away with your love. Rock and roll, it was all Gene Vincent and all these. Yeah, yeah, boy, boy. Yeah. And I can like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, it, and of course, it doesn't carry. Right, you on the left. Yeah, got me away. Well, it's not that I didn't like singing, it's that nobody else liked the way I sang. It was as simple as that. Now, since I met you. It was really uh, not a good idea. So we quickly switched to just doing instrumental stuff. So they got this call from John saying, uh, would I like to join his band? Because the guitar players couldn't read. And he knew, knew that I could read the guitar, so read the music on the guitar. So he said, if you come in, uh, that, that would be great. Most of the songs we played all featured the guitar. Walk, Don't Run. Black Stockings. The Hit and Miss. The turning point for the John Barry Seven was drumbeat. Every Saturday night it was kind of the top show and anybody who was on it became a star uh, or famous. You know, we used to go out and do concerts and of course, you know, with the John Barry Seven, you know, ooh, screaming all the time. around the stage door <laughs> used to come out and they say, excuse me, are you famous? <laughs> Jack Good had a boy on the other channel and he had Cliff Richard and the BBC wanted to know, did I know anybody else who we could have? And I said, the one person who I think has a great personality, he can't sing for hell, but he's very photogenic and that's Adam Faith. I suddenly get this call uh, from John Barry to the cutting rooms at Elstree where I was and he said we're doing a new show called Drumbeat, do you want to come along and have a go? And I said look, do this, do a couple of them, or let, do an audition and let's see, I said but don't give up your day job yet. I got six months on that Drumbeat show and I honestly I can tell you that it would not have happened without John because John insisted to Stuart Morris, the producer, that I should be one of the regulars. I always looked at John as the older generation, like a dad. He looked after me like a dad. In the studios, he looked after me. Like I had no knowledge. I don't think John had that much knowledge either, but he had a confidence about him, and it was born of a confidence in his own talent. I was in the corridor one day on a Saturday, and he came running up. He said, quick, come, come into the studio. Yes, I think I found a hit. Do you want if you don't want money? But do you want if you don't want gold? Say what you want and I'll give it to you. When we were recording it and I sang it the first time, 
They screamed and shouted at John. He can't sing it like that. It sounds like it comes from China. And John absolutely would not allow any interference in what him and I were doing. Oh, well, then you want my love, baby. I think we wound up with about eight or nine consecutive top ten hits. Well, I still go to the dance hall, listen to the noise. I try to kid myself, I'm having fun there with the boy. Yes, I did. Adam, who always wanted to act, then got his first break from a producer called George Willoughby, who was making a, a movie called Beat Go, which was about the English beatnik life in Soho at the time. John and I were managed by the same horrendous woman, Eve Taylor. But one thing she did, she knew how to leverage one artist against another. And when I got Beat Girl as a movie, the first instinct for her was, who's doing the music? I want John Barry to do the music. You want to pay me now? More action and let's talk. I think that film probably was more major than John's new career as a film writer than it was for me. I just sort of did it as a laugh. To, I was loving acting. But for John, it was, a, it was the path split at that point from pop music into film. A major break came for Barry when he was asked to arrange Monty Norman's title music for the very first Bond movie. About to finish production, the producers were under pressure to complete on time. By the Thursday of the following week, I was in the studio with the seven, plus the full orchestra. I never saw the movie, I never met Salzman and Broccoli, I never met the director. I never even read a script. I just knew of Bond, I think it was in the Daily Mail. There was a, a strip of Bond, which I'd occasionally looked at. Uh, so I knew what it was about. by Dwayne Eddy, who was a wonderful guitarist out of, uh, of America, who had done an, an album, I think, called The Twang's The Thang. And he did a lot of that, that low, down, dirty kind of uh, guitar thing. The guitar was very much featured with the, the John Barry 7 anyway. But we wanted a more dynamic, more percussive sound than we'd been getting. And it was kind of an unusual record, really, because it started off like that. Then it went into a whole big swing jazz kind of, like, almost Dizzy Gillespie bebop. Do da 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 do da. I think once they heard what John could do, um, you know, they felt that that was the right sound, that he was very contemporary. This was a new type of movie, and they needed to have a very contemporary um, sound. The actual scoring of that high brass, you know, and I've seen the score and it's very clever. I mean, John actually writes the trumpets quite high to make that tremendous crack. Everything came together in Goldfinger. It was like they'd been learning themselves, and when it came to Goldfinger, they'd got the whole style down. And everything else that went on after that, Goldfinger was a blueprint. Goldfinger was a gold album. You know, Goldfinger hit the charts internationally. 